I appreciate all of you being here tonight. Thank you for coming, being part of this Bible study. It's good to have you here tonight. We're going to open with a word of prayer and then we'll get, we'll get started with our study. Father, thank you for everything you do for us. We're thankful for the rain uh, that is falling. And we're reminded every time that it does that it's a gift from you. Uh, a gift that falls on the, on the just and the unjust. People who deserve it and people who do not. And the reason is, is because you're a God full of mercy. And you have mercy on everybody. And we're thankful for that. We pray that you will bless our time of study tonight. The mutual uh, study that we conduct. Uh, the building up of one another. The faith that we would have. The discussion concerning your word. And ultimately... Uh, for the purpose of transformation more and more into the image of your son. Thank you for every family that's here. <clears throat> Thank you for keeping us safe as we've traveled. We pray that you bless us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 20 is where we are going to be. We're starting our study of the Ten Commandments. We're moving along through the book of Exodus. We're going to try to take a, one commandment every Wednesday night. We may end up combining some. Uh, we may end up taking one or two that may take two class sessions, but either way, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. Um, I'd like to go ahead and read them. Uh, I don't know the last time you read them uh, or the last time you've gone through it. Hopefully, if you're reading along or reading ahead, it's been fairly recent, but if not, we'll go ahead and take the time to read it uh, and just look at the foundation of, of Israel, not just as a nation, uh, but as a peculiar treasured people. So let's begin with verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, am the, I the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you, or your son, or your daughter, your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder, and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. <laughs> And they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. I don't know when the last time you read it, but it's a sobering thing when you read it. Maybe perhaps we need to read it more often. As we go. So a couple of things. One question and then we'll get into some facts and then we'll get into the commands themselves uh, and the preamble. So verse 1. Verse 1. Why is it important to know that God is the one who spoke these words? Should be a, kind of a softball warm us up a little bit on a Wednesday night. What, why is it important to know that God is the one who spoke these words? Not Moses. Not Aaron. God spoke all these words saying. No interpretation. He's straight from the source. Okay, he is leaving no room for interpretation. He can't, no one can come back and say, Moses, are you sure you heard that correctly? Because God is speaking directly. Anything else? 
Any other thoughts on why God would speak directly and have the importance of this phrase that God spoke all these words? Okay, it's the basis. All right, there is no, uh, this is going to serve as a cornerstone, as a foundation. So Israel and every generation after this one, everybody will say when they recite the Ten Commandments, when they study it, God spoke these words. So you've got authority, uh, you've got power, you've got the source, as Brother Bill mentioned. There is no, there's no confusion with, the, with what he's about to say. We can't say there's a, well, maybe Moses got it wrong, or maybe, you know, maybe Moses didn't hear right. None of that. God spoke directly. Now, when we get into the New Testament, I don't have it on here, but when we get into the New Testament, Galatians will actually tell us that it was angels that delivered the law. In Galatians chapter 3, if you want to look that up. But a New Testament parallel for us is Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. That in, in long ago, in various times, various ways, God spoke to our fathers through dreams, visions, so forth and so on. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. It's almost your parallel. So Exodus 20 and verse 1 parallels with Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. Who is our God who has spoken? Not just Yahweh, but Jesus himself, the living word, has spoken. So no room for interpretation. Straight from the source. Three and a half years, here it is. And then he speaks and moves the apostles as well. Um, so the Ten Commandments, that's what we know them commonly as. They actually, you could literally call them the Ten Words. And that's what they are. They would be Ten Words. It's a Hebrew word, maybe two words. But that's how, if, if you want to know just if you are a translator, how hard things are. This is the same with Greek. It would be the same way. You get one word and you get like five English words. Uh, so just imagine two Hebrew words comes out to four words, you shall not murder. You got to interpret these, but God, it's 10 words and it's boom, 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 boom. It's 10 words. It's also called the Decalogue and you know, Deca. So that's your 10, there's your 10, 10, uh, 10 words again. The first five of these, of these words of these commands are vertical. They're between God and Israel, God and man, God and humanity. It's vertical. And then the second five deal with others. It deals with, with man to man, human to human. Uh, I mentioned this last week. The reason why that would be the case, we will never, as humanity, we will never treat each other the way we're supposed to if we don't have a proper view of who God is and what God has said. This is why it's important. God spoke these words. If I don't have enough respect for God in all the cases that I need, <clears throat> I won't respect my neighbor. I won't love my neighbor. Why would I respect you if I don't have enough for God himself? Right? So that's a basis. And it's not just respect. It'll turn out to be love and all the other things as well. But if that vertical relationship is not grounded in the way that it should, whether it's individual with God or a nation with God, if that vertical relationship is not grounded, no matter how much we desire to have the best human to human relationship, we will consistently fall short. If my relationship with God is not where it's supposed to be, no matter what I pray for and want with my husband, my wife, my children, my brother, my sister, it will always fall short because I am not where I'm supposed to be with the Father. It's the same with Christ. Right? If it's not where I'm supposed to be with Christ, my marriage, my, my children, my church family, all of these things will consistently fall short. Because that, that relationship with God directly impacts the one that I have with my neighbor. Uh, the word you, you shall not, you shall not. It's plural. And embedded in the idea is that this is, this is the agreement that Yahweh has with the entire nation. But embedded in that too is the individual. So Jonathan mentioned, you know, a Sunday, a bunch of plural. You know, you all, you all. That's true. But even the, the individual Ephesians would know God is speaking to me. I'm part of the whole. So he's speaking to all of us, but he is also speaking to me. Everybody, that's kind of, I know that's kind of assumed, but God's not leaving any room. So when he speaks to us, when the son speaks and there is a command, there is this example, whatever it is, he is speaking to all of us, but we also need to take the posture. He is speaking to me as well. It's not an idea. Uh, eight out of the 10 are negative. 
thou shalt not, this is the good King James, this is the, the King's uh, English, thou shalt not, two out of the ten are positive. Remember the Sabbath, honor your parents, honor your father and mother. So we'll, we'll explore those a little bit later. Uh, tablets, when Moses finally does it, remember he gets upset with the original and smashes them, has to go all the way back up uh, and get a new set. But when he finally does that, comes down, he places them in the ark. Why would God... Why would Moses, I, don't, I can't remember if, if God wanted him in there or not, but why, either way, why, why, are they, why are they vital in being in the Ark of the Covenant? What would be the symbolism of these ten words, these two tablets being placed in the Ark of the Covenant? What would Israel know? They're holy and protected. Okay, holy and protected. They're permanent. They're permanent. All right. They're not going anywhere. All right. And there's one other thing. When Israel set out on her journeys, what was always leading the way? So the symbolism would be what? What's the symbolism? Okay. God. And then specifically it would be his word. So three things. Remember, is you got the tablets in the ark. What else is in the ark? Oh, go ahead, Stan. Okay. Which talks about, about, have you ever heard of a, a God, you know, a God who's come down and rescued his people? Mm -hmm. I, that, and to me, I, I, I hear this of going back to God speaking to you. Mm -hmm. God came down and communicated to you, not, not through someone else, but directly. And, and that remembrance of, of, I'll say, that intimacy. That's but good God one. coming down and, and talking to his people to give them instruction, to me, is, is the remembrance of going, you know, it's almost like fathers relay this to your children. Mm -hmm. Remember how God did this. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, and I like your word with intimacy, and that would, that would tie in with John. If, John the, if the apostle John would hear, he would say, amen, because that's... How much more when the word wraps himself up in human flesh and tabernacles among us. That he would, he would say that image, the Jew would get it. That he tabernacled and he was so intimate that, that he eats with us. He sleeps with us. He does all of these things. He, all these things in that, that regard. Uh, Israel would know. What were the other two el elements in the, in the... Oh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the manna, all right, which we, which is what? Symbol, symbolized what? All right, so wherever Israel would go, God would provide. And then you had, there's one other element. Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod, which represented leadership. All right, so God would not leave, leave his people leaderless. So wherever Israel go, the three things that would make sure that she would always be on the right path, not just right, but healthy and successful. He will provide. He has spoken. He will lead. Now, God is the source, but here are the three ways in which he will do that. Every time Israel sets out, this is what she will know. There will be a visual reminder. No matter what we face, no matter what we deal with, God will provide. God will lead. God will instruct. And we will be okay. That's the, that's the visual image. Go ahead, Bob. The mercy seat's on top of that. You would have the two angels, the cherubim, on each side. And then, obviously, when Israel is faithless, breaks covenant, doesn't trust for him to provide, and rebels against his leadership, the blood of the animal, the blood of the, of the bull, is sprinkled on the mercy seat, and they are forgiven. And, of course, if you were in the Gospel of John five years ago, you would remember... Uh, that when Jesus comes out of, the out of the tomb, who are sitting on either side of the stone that's been rolled away? Two angels. He is the mercy seat now. So when Jesus, when God looks at me and you, and this is, again, John, the blood continues to flow, walk in the light as he's in the light. When he sees us today, despite we may see failure, when he sees you, he sees me, he sees the blood of his son and us covered in righteousness. In his righteousness, not ours. 
This is why we have confidence in him. Because he's our mercy seat. We still have instruction. We still have provision. We still have leadership. But who here kept all three of them perfectly today? No one. Which is why Christ and his blood continue to flow. So that's a side note. Yeah, and then added to that, the Hebrew writer will say, when you're struggling, we can therefore boldly approach his throne of grace and mercy. So mercy's all around us in that regard. If you ever wanted to study on that, just look at that from that perspective. So I left you with a question last week. Hope you had a chance to look it over. And this is, this is in verse 2. And this begins what most scholars would say is the preamble. Some would look at it and say, okay, this may be the first command, but this is the preamble. Most of them look at it and view it as a preamble to what God is going to say. So verse 3 would be considered the first command. But he says in verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And I left you with this question last week to ponder, meditate, and kind of reflect on why does God begin there? I am the Lord your God. Because you would think we're about 48 Maybe 50 days pushing it, removed from, ex, uh, from the exodus, the actual exodus, coming through dry land and, and all of that. I think at least part of it is he is one God. Okay. And, and, and I, I agree with you. So what would that mean, big picture, for Israel? Why, why is that? They're different than everybody else around them. Okay. And they're not different because of them. They're actually different because of Yahweh. Right. One God makes, makes you different. Your belief in one God. So just from an ancient world, so if I say atheistic today, if I say atheism, what do you, what do you automatically, what comes to your mind? All right, don't believe in God. But if you said atheism in the first century, or if you said it in Israel's time, what do you think people would have thought? The Jews and the Christians. Jews and the Christians. Because you don't believe in multiple gods. Because you don't believe in multiple gods, you're atheistic. And so atheism takes, a, obviously, a different turn. Uh, so, so Scott's absolutely right. On one, on one very clear spot, I am the Lord your God, not we, not us, I am. So there is not a multiple aspect of God. There's, there's me. And that's going to be a unique, uh, unique part of your existence. What else? Why else would this be important for Israel to know, I am the Lord your God? Okay, so think, yeah, okay, so you got authority, so think of a double whammy from that. You know, God spoke all these words, and then I am the, that's what he begins with, I am the Lord your God, so it's establishing an authority aspect. So there is this king, and you are my people, we need to, from the very beginning, understand who's what, who's calling the shots, we're kind of use our terminology, who's in charge. Um, you saw what I did to Pharaoh, you're no different. You know, I, I am king. Okay, can you go ahead? Uh, he did for them what they could not do for themselves. All right, so that phrase, who brought you out. We've seen that numerous times. God has said that throughout this journey, this wilderness journey. I brought you out. I brought you out. I brought you out. I think he's reminding them salvation and then instruction. Grace, then obedience. I do for you what you can't do for yourself, but I still have have this perspective of, of commandment. <laughs> Maybe also that that I brought you out of slavery is I'm fulfilling my promises to the patriarchs. Yes. You, you didn't remain slaves. You are going to become a great nation. Mm -hmm. Many will be blessed by you, etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he is fulfilling promises. Four hundred years or more. I mean you've got four hundred years of that, but even prior. You owe me. Okay. You are indebted. I know we don't think about it that, but you are indebted because I did save you. There is a, there is a natural response. I didn't save you, so now go do what you want to do. There is, again, this king, this king aspect to it. I'm thinking it emphasizes God's personal name. Uh, he's saying, I am Yahweh, your God, and, and it's I am Yahweh. Yes, yes. He's emphasized. So he's... He is revealing to the nation what up to this point only Moses has been privileged to know. So yes, I am. Uh, I am who I am. 
Uh, and I, if we're going to establish that from the very beginning. Can you think of anything else? Yes, ma'am. He's putting the responsibility of the whole exodus on himself. Okay. And taking it away from Moses because the people were giving themselves to Moses. That's a good point. So they, there's no arguing that, you know, they can't argue with Moses now, which they have before. Mm-hmm. Kind of quarreled with him. So he, you're, that's a good point if you didn't hear Miss Pam. Uh, that he's taking the whole weight of the Exodus and everything moving forward too and putting it on his shoulders and off of Moses. Moses is just here to speak. You can't, your quarrel's not with him. So if you got any quarrels, if you got any problems, all of that's going to be there. So these statements, God is, this is the preamble. He is setting the stage. So when he says, don't murder, you do not murder. Well, who are you to tell me that? I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, what right do you have to say, don't covet your neighbor's wife? I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. I have every right to tell you. I can say whatever I want to say. I can do whatever I want to do. So when you come to the New Testament and he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, but I say unto you, if you're hit, turn the other cheek. Well, who are you? I was dead. I am now alive. I have the keys to death and Hades. That's what Jesus would tell us. I am. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that. So some lessons. There's a recognition of Yahweh, the supreme one. Who is the supreme God for Israel? It is Yahweh. There is no competition. There is no one. There's no rival. None of that. There's a recognition. It's a recognition of what he's done. The entire law is based not on what God says first. It is based on what God does. Then what God says. The entire new covenant of Christ is not based on just what he said first. It is based on what he did. Death, burial, resurrection. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is based on that. Then it is based on what he says. So. He's not given all authority in heaven and earth until after his resurrection. The New Testament is still based on the same thing. It's based on the same concept. The other, God doesn't change. You mentioned the patriarchs. He goes all the way back to the very beginning. Who are you? I'm the God who's been there since before the dawn of time. That's who I am. And then you have this little phrase, I am the Lord, your God. I'm not Moab's God. I'm not the Ammonite's God. I'm yours. So that intimacy, that personal element. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't want Moab's and Ammonite's and so forth and so on. But that's that's where he is. Any questions, comments, observations? Just thinking of, you know, the the (coughs) fact that God is one. Mm -hmm. They will repeat at least two or three times a day. Yes. And that'll be generations and generations and generations, day after day after day. Yeah. Our God is one. It is. And I, that's what makes, we, we kind of start with love the Lord your God and, and get all of that. Mark's got it right. Not that Matthew's got it wrong or what have you, but Mark is the only one who says, has Jesus responding to the question, what is the greatest command? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God. Jesus embeds himself right here at this moment. In that statement, he roots himself right here in the Exodus 20 in verse 2. You shall love the Lord your God. Well, who is he? I am the Lord your God. Those phrases, that is is Jesus. That is Jewish Jesus coming out uh, in that that perspective. I saw this statement. um, from one of the commentators that because of who God is and because of what he's done, God can claim both center and circumference of his people's lives. I thought that was a great statement because we, and I say it, and we would be right. God should be the center of our life. But when you hear circumference, what do you think? Out as far as you can imagine, it's all encompassing. And I thought that was a really good statement of a, of, of a commentary, commentary statement. On just this one verse. Who I am. What I've done. I can make this claim. Jesus comes in. 
And we'll see in just a minute, he says, follow me. Well, why can you make this claim? How can you make this claim? I lived, I died, buried, was resurrected. He makes the claim based on all of those things. That's, that's where he is in that. So John, so if you want the preamble, this I am the Lord your God, if you want some New Testament parallels, John 1.1 1, 1 is, is the preamble to the entire gospel message of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If the Word is not God, why should we listen to Him? If, if Yahweh is not, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, why should I listen to you? If Jesus is not the Word, in the beginning was the Word, with God, and was God, why should I listen to you? That preamble is embedded in John 1.1. 1, 1. Then, Jeff, you mentioned the name. God is embedding his name. Seven times Jesus will use that statement. I am. I am. I am. I am. Uh, communion. He establishes the covenant. So Matthew 26. When we reflect every first day of the week on communion. This is my body. This is my blood. This covenant is not built on words on a page. It's built on actions on a cross. That's what the covenant's built on. You and I. Why do I listen to this Jesus? Well, he's eternal. You know what? He died. He was resurrected. This is why my life is on him. Confidence is in him. Uh, and then you have Paul mentioned in Christ. Galatians 1.4. Ephesians 1.3-14. 3 through 14, Revelation 1.4-8. through 17-20. through 20. All of these places. All these places. Everything is about Jesus. And then, Brother Bill, you mentioned that the people are indebted to God. Right? You owe me is kind of the idea. Well, guess what Paul will speak of? So Romans 6, 1 through 4, he will speak of our own death, our own burial. Don't you know? As many of you are baptized, baptized into Christ, raised for newness of life. You know what he talks about for the rest of the chapter? You are slaves. You, some of our versions kind of tone it down. You are servants. No, you are slaves. He owns us. And it's not a bad place to be. We don't like it. No one owns me. Well, if you're a Christian, he owns you. He owns us. He died, not me. He was resurrected, not me. He owns me. So when I said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, I was not becoming free in the sense of go do what I want. It is exactly what Paul says. My allegiance from the kingdom of darkness was simply transferred to the allegiance of the kingdom of the dear son who loved me and gave himself for me. Why do we do this? All of this, this is the preamble. This is Christ. So the New Testament goes out of its way. So this one verse, Exodus 20 and verse 2, look at how the New Testament goes out of its way to say this is Jesus of Nazareth. This is us. Any questions, comments, observations? Go ahead. The uh, covenant being in the ark and being there as a remembrance mm -hmm. kind of connects for me with that back to the Bible message that we often have. There, there's your connection to God. There is your through, connection. Through the, the covenant, the word. It is. And just like I mentioned last week, Every first day of the week is a renewal of the covenant. I fell short. His blood washes me clean. I get back up and I try again. Mm -hmm. And I follow. But every first day of the week is a renewal of the covenant. Between me and the Lord my God. You want a, you want a powerful element of communion? Think about that in a couple of days if the Lord allows. This is a renewal of the covenant between the Lord my God and me. And then... Think of it from a, this is a renewal of the covenant between the Lord, our God, and us. As you say that we're slaves, we're also set free. We are. And that's something, while we're following, Jesus came that we might live life and live it abundantly. Sure. That the life in him is the best kind of state. It is. And, and this, is, this is what Israel has to learn and what we do too. It's just going to take all of our life. The best kind of life is to live in faith and obedience. Trust what I have to say. 
So the wisdom, Solomon, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of that's embedded. Uh, but the paradox, you are set free to serve. <laughs> that's the paradox of freedom, of, of, of New Testament freedom. Here. If they broke these commandments, they were wiped out. They could have been, yes. Many, many times, stoned yes. or whatever. Yes. We were given a choice. We even had delayed punishment, and we could appeal. Mm -hmm. And you're right. God could have done it ten times over, and he doesn't. And he lives up to how he describes himself a little bit later. God of soul, steadfast love, mercy, uh, those types of things. Uh, but you make a good point. Every Jew would be born into this. The difference is, is today we get to make the choice to hitch our wagon to this. But this was Jesus' point. You better be sure of the cost that comes along with that choice. Um, at the same time, judgment is delayed because he would much rather shower with mercy. Because he wants all men to come to repentance and none to perish. Even his own people. And we'll notice that when we get to the golden calf. He doesn't rain down on them. They break it within 40 days. And he still runs away. Uh, so this other command, the second command, or the first one, if you want to look at it from verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. So this phrase, before me, it can mean the following. God can be saying it before my face, in front of me, in my presence, or in defiance of me, or in defiance to me. The one that seems to fit best as the interpretation, what does it mean before me, would be in my presence. My presence. So I want to ask a couple of things. First, so we're, we're, this would be a sign, we would assign the word idol to this commandment, right? I mean, we'll see that next, but we'll, we would assign that word. Why doesn't God just go ahead and tell Israel, all these other gods, the ones you saw in Egypt, the ones you're going to see in the promised land, why doesn't he just go ahead and say they're not real? Because Paul will say that in 1 Corinthians 8. Right? We know an idol is nothing. And then it's something. Got a little bit of confusion. But why doesn't God just go ahead and end it and say, ah, David, these, these gods are not real. Why, why say you have no other gods before me? I didn't call on you so you could just, I didn't want you to feel like compelled that you have to answer, but go ahead. Oh, no, that's why I raised my hand. But back when the miracles are going on, and other places as well, but almost every time there's a miracle, God says something like, I'm doing this so the people will know yep. who I am. Yes. So the, they were unconvinced and unconverted. They were. And I, I wonder if that's part of the answer to your question. That's, I didn't think about that. It's possible. I wonder if, they, if he says that, if he's talking about it, Pharaoh, he mentions for sure. I don't know if he's talking about the Egyptians. He's talking about Israel. <coughs> he's talking about Israel? Yeah, I'm, I'm oh. 99%. <coughs> okay. Sure, but... No, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. Why else would he say, look, I'm not going to tell you not have any other gods, because to be quite honest with you, they're not real. He had demonstrated it. All right, he had demonstrated it. Same. References to the spirits. There are spirits in this world outside of God. Yes. We, we, we have Satan. And we, we have things out there. Right? So, so, I mean, it seems that, yeah, an, an idol, I mean, I got an idol here, that's nothing. Right. That's something made, made for man. It's metal, it's wood. It's, right. Why do you worship that? And things like that. But, but there are other other. Spirits and elements out there mm -hmm. that are vying for, for people. And, and have, didn't they see that in, yep. in Egypt? They did. And, and isn't it just that you saw that I triumphed over them? Yep. You know? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a jealous God. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. Why do you want to go to the second rate king, so to speak? Correct. Yeah. Why, why would you want to go back to what I delivered you from? You know, the, the Pharaoh's doing what he's doing, yes, out of his own spite. But there's some idolatry that's moving him to enslave other people. Some of the things that the gods would do. 
And you, you make a good point, too. The magicians, the Pharaoh's magicians, were able to replicate some of the, the plagues. Uh, and it was a replication. It wasn't uh, an illusion. You know, they're not charlatans in the sense of just something fake. It's real. They turn water to blood and blood to water. Uh, so I, there is that. And Paul will mention that in 1 Corinthians 8. This is nothing. But if you, if you come to believe in something, you're believing in a spirit, a demonic spirit behind it. And if one of the reasons why God wouldn't go ahead and say that idols aren't real is because he has to acknowledge there is a Satan. There, there's an accuser. There are, there are false gods. It's not a pulpit. It's not this wood. But it's what it represents. It's what's behind it. So I, and the other thing is, you're going to live in a pagan world. So even though you may not believe that there are other gods, other people will. So I'm going to make space. Because they're just still... Jonathan, you saw this in Ephesians. Ignorant. In their understanding, darkened in their counsel. That's part of that. That's what's being alluded to. I'm not going to come out and just tell you they're not real. Because you've got to live in a world where people believe they're real. Okay? So you've got to learn to, to navigate that. And, and yeah, it doesn't matter whether they're real or not. They can still be followed. They can still. And that's the point. Yeah. And that's the point. So it is. I don't want you to have this. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't have them in my presence. Whether you acknowledge that they're real or not, do not have anything in my presence. So, since the bell rang, I want you to think about that this next week. What are some of the gods? What are we struggling with? There is no Ra. There is no Isis. There is no Osiris. There is none of those statues around. But we have other gods. What are they? What's pulling? What's tugging? What are the altars around us that we deal with day to day, week to week, that tug at our heart, that still tempt us to bring in another God into the present? So God is saying, you got me. If you bring another one and you do it like here, or even if you say, well, it's not first, but it's right, right here. God would still consider and say to the Israelite, and probably us today, you still got it in my presence. Don't have it in my presence. So I want you to think about that as we go uh, our separate way. I'm glad you're here tonight. Uh, the lesson is yours.